Hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Flores, Associate Professor of Mathematics. Thank you to the Latisms organizers for inviting me to give this lecture. I hope to speak with you about dispersive equations and take you on a math journey towards non-local vector field decompositions. All right, let's get started. From dispersive operators to non-local vector field decompositions. And first I'd like to acknowledge my PhD advisor, Gustavo Ponce, who taught me a lot of these foundational skills and has forever changed my life and my outlook on mathematics. Um, the de dispersion generalized Benjamin Ono equation, I'd like to acknowledge Derek Smith and Sung Lee Oh, who are, are just in, in, incredible collaborators that, that, are, that are wicked intelligent. And similarly for the Helmholtz, Helmholtz Hodge decompositions, Marta Delia, Petronella Radu, Helen Lee, UAU, uh, very transformative experience working with you all. And at Cal State University Channel Islands, my undergraduate researchers, Curtis, Daniel, Patrick, Sheridan, Trent, Piolo, Sabrina, and Sitlali, as well as my collaborators, Scott Feaster from Computer Science and Armin Kaverian from uh, the Material, uh, Material Science Department at uh, Navy uh, Port Wainimi Division. Now, the first part, I'd like to speak to the undergraduate audience, uh, especially if you've you know, recently taken vector calculus, uh, or maybe it's been a while already. Uh, sometimes as an undergraduate, vector calculus is one of those topics that if you're not actively using it, you might not remember all of the material from there. But I wanna even bring it back to uh, when you first start learning the definition of derivative, right? When you're learning the definition of derivative, you're basically, you've learned about graphs, you've learned about functions um, and sort of input output, and you start to compare quantities, right? Like if you're interested in the behavior at a point like X naught, you might look around and say, how are the function output values behaving for points near x naught. Uh, and so you might displace x naught by a little bit plus h. And as you start to consider those function values, let's say f of x naught, let's say x naught plus h is somewhere like here. And as you start to consider those function values and the slope of the secant line between them, right, there's the rise over run, and start to take that limit as the displacement goes to zero, so these points are going that way, the output values are heading towards there. That, that, that ratio, uh, when the limit exists, we call the derivative of f at the point x naught that we're interested in. Okay, and so you also, at some point in your calculus course, learn that if f denotes displacement, its first derivative velocity, its second derivative acceleration, and just taking a page from uh, maybe um, your physics courses, in your physics courses, you might replace the prime notation with the dot notation when those derivatives are with respect to time. And so how does this build uh, to something more, all right, to, to vector fields or to or to fractional derivatives, uh, all the way up to non-local modeling and paradynamics modeling. So I want to start with fractional derivatives, where uh, where I got a chance to really build my foundation, and the motivation at that point were waves in our physical world. And so these are some images of waves that you might see, um, for example, um, cloud formations traveling, you know, traveling in a stratified atmosphere. You can think of the atmosphere is a fluid um, with stratified densities. Maybe this is the first one that comes to mind out here in California, waves crashing in the ocean or uh, waves uh, occurring in the surface of a fluid. This is maybe a little less familiar, but you can maybe dye some, some fluid and cause it to, to move due to forces, to, for example, a magnetic field. Uh, and this, this wave is traveling at the interface of two fluids of two different densities, or surface waves, or waves of information traveling through fiber optic cables. And so these are things that we observe in our physical world. And the question is, how do we take that 
and make it into a mathematical equation? How do we capture that phenomenon mathematically? And so here's one instance that was a motivation behind um, my, my studies as a PhD student. And this is known as the Great Wave of Trans Translation, where waves were observed in a narrow channel canal in such a way that the heap of water that's forming due to, for example, an abrupt stop in the in the ships that were being unloaded in this canal, the wave formed, and unlike what you would expect, the heap of wave to uh, a heap of water to form and maybe disperse or uh, a heap of water to to, to sort of just uh, disappear or uh, maybe travel and and ripple into into different sized waves. What was interesting about this wave uh, when it was observed by Sir John Scott Russell is that it continued moving relative in, in, in just about the same size and at the same speed. And so he captured this phenomenon and did a series of experiments. And mathematically, you can capture the, the, the wave behavior by using a hyperbolic secant squared function. I just want to do a quick little, if you're wondering how, how would I check that, uh, you can do a quick little, uh, since I'm on the app, I won't be able to, to rotate this the way I would on a computer, but you can see there that there's that, it looks similar to the heap of water that's forming and it's going to travel with respect to time without really, without really changing its height. So there's your hyperbolic secant squared as a function. It has some nice, um, decay properties. And you can see that here visually. This is a, one of the first instances of waves that are considered to be dispersive. And that's a, 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 so what is dispersion? You know, how do we describe dispersion mathematically? And, and, and how do we describe dispersion mathematically? And the simple thing to remember is that it essentially means that waves of different wavelengths propagate at different phase velocities. And so if you think of a sinusoidal wave or a combination of those, you can maybe measure the wavelength by measuring the distance between um, the crest, the two crests that form, and uh, you know, other things that might be familiar to you are your amplitude. And if you fix your axis so that you kind of have an idea of where you're observing this behavior from, you have um, maybe to think of the frequency of wave crest relative to distance as well as relative to time if it's a traveling wave and so the phase velocity is corresponding to individual waves and that phase velocity is sort of timing keeping track of um, how many phases pass a given point in a, in a certain amount of time and so if you keep track of the waves of a same wavelength and um, those are traveling according uh, to a rule that depends only on that. In general, you would say that that wave is a dispersive wave. Oh, that's something you can observe. And how do you capture that mathematically? So we can start by, you know, writing down a mathematical um, formula that, that we know to have a graph that looks like waves or, or that might capture this uh, to some extent. And so we start with the exponential function. Um, we start with e to the i multiplied by kx minus omega t. We know that this is the sum of um, sines and cosines. So it's a good start. Now, we describe phase uh, velocity as this ratio of omega to k. You can think of k as the wave number. Um, you know, the sort of the number of waves that would that would um, fit in a in a in a unit distance, and uh, omega at some times in some in some references will be called the uh, like angular velocity or something like that. And that if that ratio depends entirely on k, the wave number, then we would say that wave is dispersive. And so here's. Here's one place where that appears for linear evolution equations. And so now, for those of you that have already, for example, taken on ordinary differential equations, you may have started doing some uh, 
some math that was at the very least um, motivated by some physical phenomenon. You might have said something like, we'll write down this equation to describe a phenomenon where uh, quantity is proportional to the rate of change of that quantity. This is a similar start here with linear evolution equations. Here's maybe the rate of change of some quantity with respect to time. And to an extent, we're seeing that this is related in a you know linear way involving differential operators to that same quantity. And when we're looking at systems like this, uh, linear evolution equations, we'll say that this as a PDE system is dispersive if the solutions to this PDE uh, result in a dispersive wave in the way that we described it there, where waves of um, different frequencies correspond to um, speeds, their corresponding speeds depend on those frequencies. I'll start with this as an example. Uh, this example, the Kortweg de Vries equation, my linear differential operator is a third order derivative, x and t are real valued, so we have a one-dimensional physical space and time, unbounded, so we don't worry about domains. An initial condition, an initial configuration is stated, and we want to see, does this admit waves that are considered dispersive? So we start with the ansatz that we are described previously, and if you work this out, right, if you, if you work this out, you know, take the time derivative, take three physical derivatives, the condition in order for this general solution to work is that we have to have that omega depend on k. In fact, omega has to be in minus k cubed. And so when we divide by k, that wave number, we get negative k squared. And so the phase velocity explicitly depends on the wave number. And so this is a dispersive system. It's a wave system with very interesting mathematical properties, including that it has very strong decay properties, kind of like the hyperbolic secant squared. And um, it's also an example of an integrable system. Now to consider more uh, examples of, of the kind that I want to talk about today, uh, dispersive systems, I need a few tools from Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis is an entry point to um, harmonic analysis, which deals a lot more with the operators involved in these dispersive systems or in, in, in other systems in general. And I'll start with the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is one where if you're interested in transforming a given function f, you multiply it by e to the negative 2 pi i x c and integrate over your domain. Uh, and you've introduced this c, uh, a real value. In this case, we're keeping this on the real value line, but you can definitely do this in higher dimensions. And if this integral exists, we call the new function, which is now a function that depends on the variable C, the Fourier transform of F. Why we would do this is a very interesting question in and of itself. And uh, I urge you to think about the collection of functions, negative 2 pi i x, where C is a natural number or, or an integer. And maybe restrict the domain uh, to uh, one that's maybe 2 pi length, and you might get some interesting properties of that collection of functions. Now, about the Fourier transform itself, one thing that we can observe right away is that if I try to differentiate this quantity here with respect to xi, uh, so there's the dependence on xi, what I'd get is a factor of negative 2 pi i x, this part right there, coming down. And that by definition, I'd be getting the Fourier transform of negative 2 pi i x. And so in some, in some way to look at it, I, I can do up to a constant multiplication by x or powers of x in the original configuration space Fourier transform that, and what I'm then analyzing are differentiability properties of the Fourier transform. And so there's a relationship between differentiability and multiplication by x. 
And so to some extent, that gives me a sense of integrability of f being multiplied by polynomial type functions and a way to analyze differentiability of the Fourier transform. And that goes both ways. There's also other great um, properties about the Fourier transform. It's a unitary operator, for instance, on square integrable functions. It has a Fourier inverse and um, it has some nice convolution properties and we're going to use it to define another transformation called the Hilbert transformation. Now the Hilbert transformation is also a great tool coming from that realm of uh, Fourier analysis and we take our function f, convolve it with 1 over x and we see kind of that happening here and while we want to integrate it over an entire domain you might run into trouble because you've convolved with 1 over x. So we take out the parts of the domain that are that potentially problematic and take the limit as epsilon goes to 0. Um, doing all this is, is called the principal value and multiply by 1 over pi. And it takes some work to show that you can set up this uh, Hilbert transformation using the definition, or you can take that function f, take its Fourier transform, multiply by the sine function, the one that outputs 1 if the input c is positive, and negative 1 if the input c is negative, and inverse Fourier transfer that, multiply by negative i, and these are equivalent for the most part. Uh, these are essentially the same, and this is giving you some freedom to apply tools from for, uh, from Fourier analysis while also studying the Hilbert transformation. Hilbert transformation is also got its set of interesting properties, like being an isometry on that L2 space of square integrable functions. It's anti-symmetric. Um, with respect to the inner product in L2. It's a singular integral operator, which I'll give the formal definition to uh, because it's relevant for when I start to consider and, and, le and learn more about non-local non -local theories. It has an interesting product rule. And um, again, it, it allows you to really switch back and forth between um, the space, uh, it allows you, because it's an isometry in all two spaces and you have this inverse 40 transform, it gives you freedom to work whether in your original configuration space or in frequency space. And again, doing that sort of code switching, uh, differential properties in the frequency space or decay properties in the original configuration space. And it has this other really cool uh, uh, property related to analytic uh, functions when you extend into the complex plane. Uh, it's really cool. Ask me about it. I would love to talk about it. But I think um, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it at that. And so the definition of singular integral operator is to take a function, a singular integral operator, let's say script T, is one that takes your function F and does a... Uh, convolution with omega of y, where omega's got some special property, divided by uh, absolute y to the power n, and we see that limit here appearing. Now, omega is a special function defined on the unit sphere. It's homogeneous of degree zero. Uh, it's integrable with zero average, zero average on that unit sphere. And the Hilbert transform is potentially one of the, um, I don't want to say easiest, but definitely one of the earliest examples that you learn of a singular integral operator, because you can define it in n is equal to one dimensions, where omega of y is given by y over absolute y. Okay, And to be a singular integral operator, uh, that function omega is very important because there are definitely several operators out there or or transformations or potentials that 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 look like this form uh, 
uh, but but don't fall into exactly this um, configure this classification. Okay, so the Benjamin Ono equation is another dispersive system I would like to talk about that I spent a lot of time thinking about. It involves the Hilbert transformation and the second order derivative on u. So that is my operator that I would consider for this linear evolution equation. And the question is, is this a dispersive system? In order to consider that, again, we're on that real line. We have a given initial configuration. In order to find the dispersion, dispersion relation and the phase velocity, we apply that Fourier transform. When you apply the Fourier transform, you do it in the, the physical variable. Uh, and if you follow the definitions closely, you'll see that this remains a time derivative, but that second order derivative, partial x squared, essentially becomes multiplication by c squared. Now, because remember, Fourier transform, Hilbert transforms our isometries on the space of square integral functions, um, I've taken this, what I wrote in the couple of uh, slides and switched the frequency and the, the, the physical variable and so we have that multiplication by c squared. Here's, here's that polynomial of degree two. Here's the differential operator of degree two. But we have a Hilbert transform. So remember, we pick up a minus i and a sine of c. And of course, a constant. That constant doesn't play too closely into what we're getting at. So I just summarized it as a constant. We Fourier transform that initial given con configuration. And in order for you to find out when is this a solution, well, essentially what's happened is you've taken your PDE and by applying the Fourier transform, notice that there's only one derivative in this equation, the derivative with respect to time. So your Fourier transform has essentially created a situation where you now only need to solve an ordinary differential equation. And so in order for the ansatz to, to lead to a solution to this ordinary differential equation in the frequency space, you need omega to have this uh, relation, omega of xi equal to negative xi, absolute value of xi. And when you divide by xi, you get a phase velocity that essentially depends on that frequency variable. And that is the definition of being a dispersive system. So the Benjamin Ono equation is also a dispersive system. It has uh, solitary wave solutions with a similar profile to the KDV. It is also a completely integral system. It conserves uh, fin infinitely many quantities. And one of the maybe differences, interesting differences, is that while solitary waves or those 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 waves like in that image for KDV um, display exponential decay, very strong decay at infinity, the Benjamin Ono equation display only mild decay. And so there's some many similarities, but some some interesting differences. And moreover, there's an there's a whole spectrum of operators. A whole spectrum of operators with with a range of dispersive strengths that to some extent connect the disperse that connect the operator the differential operator from the kdv to the benjamin ono equation so you can maybe think about this in the frequency space as being multiplication by c cubed and here multiplication by c squared times the sine c but in absolute value, you know, we have uh, degree two, uh, degree three, and then maybe a whole fractional range in between. And this uh, viewpoint and observation point where we're considering maybe decay of u in, in the frequency, I'm sorry, decay of u in the, in the physical space and regularity of u in frequency or vice versa, depending on what your interest is. Now, some fun theorems. I had an opportunity to study um, the decay properties of solutions to the Benjamin Ono equation in, in weighted uh, Sobolev spaces. And you can see maybe where the weights are coming from. It's just coming from that, uh, that fact that, that when you take the derivatives, you have like a polynomial term appearing. Uh, really, they're well, inspired by works of um, 
Herman Fonseca, Felipe Linares, Gustavo Ponce, my advisor, um, Well Posedness by Iorio, established uh, and really, you know, really inspired this body of work. And moving from there, uh, there was a period of time where I was really into exact controllability and stabilizability of dispersion generalized Benjamin Ohm equations on the uh, for one dimensional torus, which is just another way of saying a periodic domain. The dispersion generalized Benjamin Ohm equation referring to that range, um, dispersive oper operators in that range between the KDV and the Benjamin Ohm equation. And I did this with uh, Sung Lee Oh and Derek Smith. Uh, and basically, uh, controllability and stabilizability refers to when you're working on uh, a PDE and you have an initial desired configuration and some other configuration at a later time that you would like to achieve. And the question there is, is there an external force that you can apply to your system to bring your system from that desired initial configuration to the desired final configuration? That's the controllability part. And the stabilizability part is, can you do it in a way where your controller, um, whatever external controller that you've, you know, discovered or created or built is, uh, is stable to some extent? For example, uh, we know that we can model, um, you know, like heat, for example. Um, and maybe we want to have a initial configuration with respect to heat and a final configuration with respect to heat and you apply an external controller, um, for example, a gauge or something like that or, or something. But let's say, you know, you're initially very cold and, uh, you know, the heat is low and, and you want it to increase. You don't want to burn the whole place down, right? Like you want to have some stable type of control. And so this is really fun mathematics. Um, you have to really understand the spectral properties of your, of your, um, of your operators. And so for those that are, you know, sort of studying matrices and eigenvalues and eigenvectors, operators uh, to some extent are, you know, I, I, I don't want to say infinite sized matrices because it's not quite that way, but but they have properties like matrices, including a spectrum of things that are uh, sort of um, counterparts to eigenvalues. And if you understand those, you'll understand properties about the systems related to these on, uh, on a periodic domain. That gives you some, some really cool opportunities to, to do things with numbers. Okay, so I want to talk about vector fields now. Uh, a quick a quick re reminder of your vector fields and you know when we first learned them as undergrads we we've, we've or you know whenever you learn them visualize them as arrows with a direction and magnitude um, you can you can think of these as vector valued functions um, there there are um, examples like models that explain speed and direction of fluid flows or wind trajectories when you watch the news or strength and direction of forces in your physics classes. I think I'm going to uh, skip my example of field play, but if you have an opportunity, it's an open source, uh, it's an open source uh, vector field app uh, on GitHub. It's really cool. Um, and just a quick reminder of those vector operators. For example, the gradient, uh, a vector field symbolic of the direction of the rate of greatest increase of a given function f. And you take that function f and you collect the partial derivatives into a vector, and there you have the gradient. You can use it to define a directional derivative. And in some cases, as an analogy to, um, to the way the derivative behaves when you first learn it, and some of its other notations are there on that slide. And we also have the divergence of a, of a given vector field. And something to, to always keep in mind with um, once you get into vector operators is sort of the domain and range. Your f here is a scalar valued function, but here f is a vector valued function. And for a vector valued function, you get, um, you take the sum of the partial derivatives and you actually get a scalar-valued, you know, function or operator. Uh, 
And these are used to understand the flux of that given vector field F. And so essentially, if the divergence, which is a scalar value, is positive at a given point, it's telling you that the vector field F at, around that given point is, is behaving in a way that things are moving away from that point. The vector field is moving away from that point. And if the divergence is less than zero or negative, uh, it's giving you a sense of how the vector field is moving towards that point. Uh, in some sense, this is also giving you, you can also maybe describe this using words like compressibility. Okay. And then finally, the curl. If you have a curl, a vector field in R3, this is specific to R3, you can define curl, although there are notions um, of something similar, like a rotational operator in higher dimensions. But in R3, we can define the curl. Uh, you know, it's the determinant of, of this um, object here. And it's used to describe rotation of a vector field. So if you have your vector field, um, the axis of rotation, you can think of maybe uh, like a ball suspended in a fluid uh, flowing according to F. And so if your ball is suspended in this fluid, it's going to be, if you have a little, little, I don't know, what are they, like ping pong ball, ping pong, no, maybe, or a paddleboard bar, the little, the little one, and at it, it, each one of those is at the point uh, of your vector field, and your vector field is describing a fluid flow, it might cause that little ball suspended in the fluid to rotate. And the axis of rotation is the other vector field called the curl of F. Okay, and with that, you also learned classical flux. Um, and so, for example, if you considered your vector field F, let's say in R3, and you imagine maybe a fixed surface, uh, but just uh, just the uh, sort of parameters of that surface. It's not a, not necessarily a, um, it's not a, it's something that is enclosing or stopping. Uh, it's not a barrier or, or, or um, an obstacle, but just a, sort of just the configuration of that surface, maybe like a mesh or a net. It doesn't obstruct the flow of your vector field. And you start to um, maybe compare the the um maybe the angles between that your original vector field f and the normal vector to the surface now what you're what you are potentially the kinds of information you're potentially getting if you think of your vector field maybe having units uh like kilograms per meter cube times meters per second and you add those up across all these infinitesimally small areas. After integration, your units are something like kilograms per second. And what you get is a unit for flux or mass flow rate. And so this is what we call maybe the classical flux. And once you have that, and I'll tell you a little bit why um, I'm interested in something like, let's say you have two cubic domains uh, sort of the way they're pictured here, omega-1 and omega-2. And they're, again, they're just um, maybe symbolic of areas that I'm looking at. And I want to look at the way a vector field uh, flux is behaving at the interface uh, or where those two domains touch, that surface where they intersect. For it to make sense, that intersection has to be non-empty. We can think of flux from omega-1 into omega-2, giving us a sense of how what's happening in omega-1 is affecting what's happening in omega-2 by taking that uh, flux integral. Now, the problem is, at least in, in this framework, there's no way to define flux between two disjoint sets. If omega-1 and omega-2 are have an empty intersection, I cannot really define the flux from one to two, and I can't really capture how what's happening in omega one is affecting an omega two. And in some situations, you don't need that, right? They might be too far away and you don't need that. But in other situations, in other modeling situations, uh, or just mathematically in general, you might be curious to know if there's any influence from omega one 
towards omega-2. And this is where uh, we have an opportunity to define a non-local flux. And now we're starting to enter that non-local domain. Um, just want to say that Stuart Sealing receives a lot of the recognition for for coining the term like paradynamics and um, and so this is this is heading towards that that framework and that and that direction. Given uh, a, a two point two 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 vector input function, scalar valued function psi, uh, which is anti-symmetric, we can define flux from omega one into omega two by doing this double integral. And so this this leads to a whole uh, body of work. Um, I'll talk about more. I'll talk. I'll speak more about that later. But here the trick is to sort of maybe the 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 goal is to understand psi. How do you find psi? How do you capture the kinds of interactions you were hoping to understand between those two disjoint sets, omega one and omega two? Okay. Now I want to go from decompositions of vector fields to mathematical modeling uh, using a non-local approach. Okay, so now what is mathematical modeling? It depends on what your problems are, but in applied mathematics uh, have to do with, for example, maybe um, materials and, and, and the way the materials behave or uh, forces acting on, on, you know, material points or something like that. You start with your, your reference configuration. Maybe there's a reference coordinate system for you to do the mathematics around that. And you, you, you take a page from your physics book, like let's say Newton's second law and force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, and, and some of the motivations behind, you know, what I'm going to be considering here is that I want to model materials that undergo forces that cause damage. Uh, on a little, you know, we'll start thinking about why I have to move away from the classical framework when I'm interested in damage. And we need to know what causes material points to move or shift in the situations where my reference configuration is made up of a, it's a bunch of material points. Um, and eventually I want to understand what causes them to move away in such a way that describes damage to that material. A material could be a ceramic, it could be a plastic, it could be a fabric, but those are examples of materials. It could be a metal and what causes uh, those material points to move away and cause damage. Now, you might, there's a number of ways to do this, but you might even imagine that each of those material points takes on a certain geometry. Uh, small scale geometries like cubes, cylinder, sphere, something that will help you explain uh, small deformations or degradations. In the classical case, we will use a cube, okay? So we capture, let's say, ah, I'm going back really quickly, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So I have to figure out what's what are my forces, what's my mass, what's my acceleration? And typically, we know how to describe maybe the forces that are acting on um, you know, displacements of material points, and we that will give rise to a differential equation system that can be solved usually numerically, and that once you have the solution, the solution that you obtain is the displacements, and then you know how it moves. Okay, so we capture that acceleration term by introducing a displacement function u. We we are expecting a deformation, so we're not expecting our reference configuration to stay in a fixed configuration and have no displacement whatsoever. There's going to be some displacement. When we get a displacement, we'll track where that original material point X moved to and was displaced to at a later time. We're going to want to solve for that displacement function, but now we've given it a mathematical name. And if U is the displacement vector at time T from the, uh, our reference position X, then its second derivative will be the acceleration term that we're looking for to plug into that Newton's second law. What we need also is to describe the forces. And classically, you use the Cauchy stress. So if you think of each of those material points as cubes and sort of being uh, near one another, but what the forces acting on the cube 
uh, we'll, we'll cause it to move sort of this way, left, right, top, bottom, and, and front, back. And we can start giving each of those forces its own coordinate system. Okay. Now, uh, we can sort of talk about the strain that each of the faces is facing. But um, what I'm interested in considering are small deformations. Uh, and so in order to do that, we can think about the um, small deformations in sort of each of the directions. If I think of H uh, as a small value and think about the displacements, I'm doing, you know, sort of like the, the change in the displacement relative to a, uh, uh, relative to a small change in the, in the initial configuration. And in the limit, I can think of these forces as, um, the divergence of the stress tensor. And so that's one of the configurations you might see. You might, in, you know, introduce a, uh, mass or mass density function. You have the acceleration coming from the second derivative of the displacement. You have the forces causing those small configurations and any additional external force. And this is one way to arrive at a mo mathematical model that when you solve, you obtain the displacement u. You can maybe do this numerically and render u so that you obtain a simulation for how that co initial configuration will evolve according to the forces acting on it. And, you know, again, that happened that happened to depend on, on sort of a limit existing. And so what happens if you can't pass to the limit and how do you model those forces, especially in the, in, in the situation that we want to understand damage and those small uh, displacements might not be occurring in a way where that limit exists. And that's where we enter the realm of non-local modeling. I really want to move towards vector field decompositions. I'll tell you how. But as far as non-local modeling is concerned, here's that reference. Um, um, here's that reference coordinate system. The blue is a reference configuration. And instead of at this moment thinking of X as a cube and all the forces acting on that little cube, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a neighborhood around the point X that I'm interested in. Sometimes the neighborhood is called the horizon, but H of X, you can think of as a ball of radius delta. Delta is often called the horizon. And this neighborhood describes an interaction zone between X and let's say X prime, another point in that interaction zone. And I'm instead of thinking of the points X, X prime, I'm going to think of the vector C between X and X prime. And these are called bonds. Um, so consider instead forces acting on the bonds inside the interaction zone. And so what's happening is that we're moving closer to the peridynamics equation of motion, uh, the conservation of linear momentum equation. So here's still my displacement function. There's my bond. There's my bond plus its displacement in the deform configuration. Uh, so there's the displacement acting on the point X prime. Here's my bond, and there's my bond in the deformed configuration. And you can think of that as in, in terms of C plus a displacement. How much did the bond actually move? Uh, and so I still have a displacement function U. I still have acceleration and mass density. But instead, I'm going to introduce a non-local pairwise force function that describes the vector force exerted on um on the points in the interaction zone with respect to x and uh, for example vector per unit volume and so i still have mass acceleration but instead i'm going to add up all of the forces acting on the bonds and the display you know the forces with respect to the bonds and the displaced bonds in the interaction zone and that will describe my force my force function. And in this sense, I only am concerned that this integral exists, which requires a lot less of the original displacement function. It doesn't require, for example, for it to have, you know, derivatives or something like that.
and any external forces that I might need. And this is the uh, classical peridynamics equation of motion. But with this, I've entered um, a realm that has a whole nother set of tools, definitions, and a new framework that's really interesting. And so one of the things um, that, that first caught my interest is the actual vector fields themselves. Um, so let's take a pause from the peridynamics equation of motion for a, a small moment because right now I want to talk about vector fields themselves. Going back to vector fields, you know, each of the vector field operators gives you a little sense, a uh, little piece of information about some phenomenon you might be observing. And something that might be helpful is breaking down that vector field into an irritational, incompressible, and a third term that you wouldn't see in R3 necessarily, uh, uh, a term that's both irritational and incompressible so that you can start to understand your fluid better, start to visualize it in a way, how is it, you know, isolating from compressibility and rotation, uh, rotational. Um, this has many applications in fluid flows, in animation, uh, in computer vision and robotics, and even in earthquake wave decomposition. So it's really just take something like a vector field and break it down into smaller parts. And how do you do that? And so that's been well studied in the classical, using the classical definitions and leads to a Helmholtz Hodge decomposition, depending on which avenue you're, you're taking to, to understand that you might have a decomposition of differential forms, for example, or a, a more applied sort of now decomposition in R3. Now, in order to understand this now from the non-local framework, considering that we have all these tools and benefits for doing that, we're going to introduce some definitions. And I, this is maybe the messiest of slides, but it starts to, um, I hope that it'll start to connect a little bit to our conversations on singular integral operators. So let's say the non-local divergence takes an, an anti-symmetric two-point vector field for a given two-point vector field. And when I when I integrate this quantity, uh, we call that alpha a non-local kernel, we get a non-local divergence. And similarly, uh, for non-local gradient, what we have to, maybe the main difference is that here I have a scalar multiplication with my non-local kernel. Here I have a dot product with my non-local kernel. So non-local divergence gives me an output that is real valued and non-local gradient gives me a vector valued output. Okay, so so V is some two-point vector field, eta is some two-point vector field, alpha, beta, these are non-local kernels. Uh, and similarly for curl, I can take an anti-symmetric uh, kernel here, a traditional cross product. That's why I need mu to be a uh, R3 valued vector field, two point vector field, two, two vector inputs. Um, there are adjoints to these, to these operators. Uh, so that's sort of the, the set of definitions that I'm using. Um, here's an example of how you might arrive at a non-local operator that'll, that'll, that'll be really reminiscent of some of the, um, like singular integral operator definitions. And so, so I borrow my, my, my experience in that space and bring it into this space. And also let's say for scalar value discontinuous functions u and I want to discover a non-local operator, really have to give a shout out to Petronella Radu for, for showing me this. It was super intuitive. Um, so let's say you expand in the Taylor series um, centered around a point x. Okay, so you're doing your Taylor expansion. Here's my center. Um, uh, evaluating at x plus y, so x plus y minus x gives me just the y, y squared over 2 factorial. And I really want to isolate that u double prime. Right? I want to give a, a sense of how do I understand a second order derivative and do it by um, using this Taylor expansion. There's some convenience here because if I do the integration on a convenient domain and use that this uh, integral vanishes, now I have my opportunity to isolate u double prime. Uh, of course, there's up to some 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 terms here, but uh, you know, every time 
um, that you're doing this, sort of your your domain, um, this constant, you want to do it in a way where the parts that you're cutting off are essentially, uh, you know, remove, not removable, but can be ignored. A non-local Laplacian now, um, more generally, you can do this, but now multiply every term by a potential kernel function. Uh, and this is maybe where the fun begins, because then you have some constraints that you want that kernel to satisfy. And what are those constraints? Maybe you want it so that, um, you know, this uh, integrand remains odd, so that this still vanishes, and you can isolate that second order derivative um, and have uh, some error analysis that'll um, allow you to pass the limit and make the statement where you can define a non-local Laplacian uh, using this integral value, but you have to be careful now uh, because unlike this is this is fine in maybe one dimension, but as you move into higher dimensions, you might run into a little trouble that this is not a two two point um, two input function. So well, those are the kinds of challenges that we well those are the, that's the framework and the motivation behind the Helmholtz Hodge decompositions in the non-local framework uh, with my collaborators here. And we started with some, you know, a question. If I take a two-point vector field, can it be decomposed non-locally? Do there exist a uh, scalar phi and vector field W so that I can have the decomposition to grad phi plus um, non-local curl W? Will there be a third term? Uh, what does that look like, especially since, you know, now the Laplacian seems to be defined in a one-point way? The short answer is yes, there's going to be a decomposition. We also are interested in uniqueness and um, are, is there more than one? And so there were several challenges, some of them being that those classical, um, you know, notions that you're used to having, you know, like div curl vanishes, um, curl grad vanishes, are no longer true in the non-local framework. That's both a challenge, but also an opportunity to learn something that maybe we couldn't understand in the classical framework. There's non-trivial terms in the intersection of um, the kernels of uh, divergence and curl. That's also a very interesting thing. And for example, in the classical framework, that leads to harmonic functions. What does it mean here in the non-local framework? And one thing that we really needed was from a, if u is given, can you solve for w in something like this? It was, it's hard to know. Um, so we needed to answer that. And that was the first thing that we did. Um, so a strategy, how would you find phi and w? Uh, you use, we started with the classical strategy. And again, that led to well posedness questions. And so with so with the correct volumetric constraints, the first one had some existing well posedness theory, and the second one almost had some well posedness theory. There were some limitations that we talk about in the paper. Uh, and so, for example, some of the limitations, we, we had existing theory, like due to Du and Mangesha, we had that um, this... Um, uh, equation where that blackboard C is micromodulus tensor, this reduces down to the well posedness of uh, this equation down here for special choice of rho and F naught. So there is some existing well posedness there, but we we wanted something, what, as we were studying, we found that there's actually something more general. In fact, the well posedness of Dua Mangesha did not apply to give us the result in our case. And so we our first result was a well posedness proposition that actually for, um, for a given positive or negative semi-definite operator uh, with this uh, sort of kernel properties, um, con the containment of the kernel of those operators being contained in the kernel of the non-local curl, then the system is well posed if and only if V is the non-local curl of some given vector field. And that's exactly what we needed. And so here, you know, we have to show some 
uh, coercivity results and use the lux milligram and the, the argument follows. And then once we are equipped with that well posedness result, we can show the first uh, non-local Helmholtz Hodge decomposition for bounded domains. If we are given a U, uh, then we, there exist V and W such that U can be decomposed into the non-local gradient of V plus the curl, the non-local curl of W plus a third term, which we called H of X, Y. H is specifically in the, in the intersection of these two kernels, um, and the boundary conditions, when they're Dirichlet, lead to existence of a unique phi, and in the Neumann condition, lead to existence of a unique phi up to a constant. Okay, this uh, script N is an interaction operator, and moreover, we show the decomposition is orthogonal in L2. And finally, a uh, unique decomposition for the in the non-local Helmholtz Hodge decomposition theory. We have that for a given U, there exists a unique phi and W in L2, where again we have that three-term decomposition. And this is um, um, an interaction operator as well. We can think of gamma as a thick, thick part, uh, like a thick boundary to omega. So to some extent, they're like non-local boundary conditions. And again, H is in that kernel uh, intersection. Okay, and the discomposition is orthogonal and unique. And a quick remark with existence, we just crank it out in a way that we talked about with L2 orthogonality. Again, this is the, the sort of L2 space um, orthogonality that we're talking about and you know your uniqueness by contradiction. Now in the future, what I hope to do is um, take my undergraduate research team pictured here, I had to, had to picture them, and um, work on those non-local models, uh, but specifically work on damage models in situations where our material is a metal and we're considering um, um, a corrosive process, for example, that leads to that leads to damage uh, and running the simulations and uh, writing down the appropriate force functions that, that lead to the kind of uh, damage that is observed in the laboratory. That's a really interdisciplinary work. I'm really excited to work with that. Um, I work at a um, uh, undergraduate serving institution, so it's always fun to find a project that, that gets students motivated. And with that, I'll take um, a page from my colleagues' books and thank you uh, for being a non-local audience. Take care.